If I hold up one hand with two fingers, the two fingers come together in a V and produce an angle. That angle focuses the import and connects the two in such a way that they are viewed as one. This one is the Churchill victory sign that was adopted in the 60s and used so effectively by RFK to sort of charm the younger set. If I hold up two fingers, one from each hand, this is a different kind of two. These two form a single unit which we would call roughly the V sign. These two are a pair. They do not form a unit which resolves as one, but they form a resonance which resolves as the space in between them as a zero. Nature always begins in manifestation by having paredness the consonance of which is zero. That was a very big mystery. And during the second half of the lecture today, we'll look at it in terms of why 21st century science is beginning to understand that this is how things work. So that when we have a 21st century Lucretius writing a De Rerum, De Rerum Natura, a 21st century Lucretius would emphasize the paredness which resolves as zero rather than the duality which resolves as one. This is a major difference. It's a major difference. But before we get to that, we need to discuss Patterns of Culture by Ruth Benedict. But before we can get to that, we have to alert ourselves to the fact that we are reading in a graduated format throughout the whole year some journey, either the Odyssey by Homer, which is a feminine journey cycle. All the action in the Odyssey moves by Odysseus encountering women. It is the women whose characters are the pivots of all the significance that the Odyssey is. This is why Homer, in putting in a diction cadence in the Odyssey, put in a kind of a skipping along, looping motion, because there's a sense of play, of universal play, in that paredness. The other journey, Moby Dick, is a masculine journey. Moby Dick is rather like uh, the Iliad, in a way. Someone once described the Iliad as the mysterious launching of a great gray battleship in a fog-shrouded harbor into water which one cannot see. And the only way that one can make certain is to insist upon occasionally objectifications of poking, of knocking, of testing, to make sure that something is there. And so Moby Dick is a masculine journey and has the most serious intent to establish by poking or knocking or touching, or getting down to it in the most fundamental way to determine whether anything is there in life. And of course, our whole approach, either the Odyssey or Moby Dick, our whole approach of using a book, an epic book like this, throughout the entire year, is to provide a substrate for the 
four-part investigation, nature, ritual, myth, symbol. We need to have a substrate that unites those four so that the fourness is not experienced prematurely as some kind of archetype. The premature experience of an archetype means, as Carl Jung once pointed out, that the archetypes have us. We don't have them. And we would like to have them and not them have us. Yeah, it's a very delicate process. And in order to help this substrate disclose the archetypal significance in form in the right way, we have graduated reading, only a few pages each week. Do not jump ahead, do not fall behind. It's like a metronome that keeps time and keeps cadence. One can then play the melodic line much easier with a metronomic substrate. This is why a composer always places above the uh, signature key the time. Andante, <laughs> presto. Molto pianissimo. Why? Because it is the cadence that carries the energy flow. And it's the way in which time carries space. And aside, even in superstring theory, where there are three distinct space uh, coordinates, there is only one time coordinate. There's only one time dimension. So that graduated reading over a full year of a specific journey like this has a disclosure quality which gives the disclosure a sense of those who here come in possession of the form in their terms rather than the premature lunging of the form which co-ops the audience. It makes all the difference in the world. 2,400 years ago, when Ezra and Nehemiah realized that the Jewish population had simply either ignored the Torah or had become fanatical because the Torah had engulfed them and that there was nobody in the congregation who was there. They were either there because they were um, fundamentalists who were raging about the Torah or they were um, apost apostasy victims who could care less. And so they modulated the hearing of the Torah so that each Sabbath a certain section of the Torah was read. No more, no less. This much, no more. This much, no less. And that it took three years, three years of Sabbaths to hear the entire Torah in this graduated way. And out of that came a new kind of congregation, a congregation that could finally hear something more than just the Torah, something more than just the prophets. They could hear what became a new genre of sacred literature in the Jewish experience called wisdom literature, like the Book of Job, like the Song of Songs. So this is an ancient technique, an ancient technique. In medieval times, they would portion out readings for every day of the year from the New Testament, from the Gospels. And you would read this little reading of this day of the year. That was another kind of an attempt to utilize the same procedure, the same process. So our process is very refined tradition. Each week, whatever journey you're following, of the Odyssey or a Moby Dick, it is your responsibility to pace yourself. 
Anyone who has worked at physical labor knows you must pace yourself to keep going. It's the youngster who comes in and sweeps the whole house in one day and has a backache for three days. In Moby Dick, this week's reading concerns the masthead, chapter 35. All the chapters in Moby Dick, as you will discover, are very short. The masthead is the tallest, highest, most isolated point on a ship, on a whaling ship. At the very top of the highest mast is the last place on the ship before one would transcend it forever, that a person can stand. The crow's nest, the masthead. Melville, in beginning chapter 35, says, writes, it was during the more pleasant weather that in due rotation with the other seamen, my first masthead came round. In most American whalemen, the mastheads are manned almost simultaneously with the vessels leaving her port, even though she may have 15,000 miles or more to sail ere reaching her proper cruising ground. And if, after a three, four, or five years' voyage, she is drawing near home when it, with anything empty in her, say an empty vial even, then her mastheads are kept manned to the last, and not till her sky sail poles sail in among the spires of the port does she altogether relinquish the hope of capturing one whale more. This is American Renaissance dedicated Dharma. This is the kind of discipline that made Abraham Lincoln irresistible for keeping something together. At the end of the chapter on the masthead, we hear Melville admonishing us at once to pay attention to a perilous asterisk detail that one should not miss. And here it is. Very often, then, do the captains of such ships take those absent-minded young philosophers to task, upbraiding them with not feeling sufficient, quote, interest in the voyage, half hinting that they are so hopelessly lost to all honorable ambition, that as that in their secret souls they would rather not see whales than otherwise. But in vain, all, all in vain, those young Platonists have a notion that their vision is imperfect. They are short-sighted. What use then to strain the visual nerve? They have left their opera glasses at home. Why, thou monkey, said a harpooner to one of these lads, we've been cruising now hard upon three years, and thou hast not raised a whale yet. Whales are scarce as hen's teeth whenever thou art up there. Perhaps they were. Or perhaps there might have been shoals of them in the far horizon, but lulled into such an opium-like listlessness of vacant, unconscious reverie is this absent-minded youth by the blending cadence of waves with thoughts that at last he loses his identity takes the mystic ocean at his feet for the visible image of that deep blue bottomless soul pervading mankind and nature with and every strange half-seen gliding beautiful thing that eludes him seems to him the embodiment of those elusive thoughts that only people the soul by continually flitting through it. In this enchanted mood, thy spirit ebbs away to whence it came, becomes diffused through time and space, like Wycliffe's sprinkled pantheistic 
pantheistic ashes forming at last a part of every shore the round globe over. There is no life in thee now except that rocking life imparted by a gently rolling sea, a gently rolling ship, by her borrowed from the sea, and by the sea from the inscrutable tides of God. But while this sleep, this dream is on ye, move your foot or hand an inch, slip your hold at all, and your identity comes back to you in horror. Over Descartian vortices you hover, and perhaps at midday, in the fairest weather, with one half-throttled shriek you drop <laughs> through that transparent air into the summer sea. No more to rise forever. Heed it well, ye pantheists. <laughs> what is the lesson? You must compute zero into every objective reality through paired resonance and not mistake the unity of form which is so impressive as being the arbiter of what is real. If you begin counting at one, you will forever mistake the unspoken substrate algorithm, <laughs> and your computations will be off just enough to allow you to plunge and bring the tragic horror of your identity back as a problem. <laughs> just before you hit the sea, the ocean, that is truly mysterious and quite actually there, though not able to be delegated by any counting number. This is important, and any real education that seeks to bring out the real person in enough examples to populate a cosmos must have this, needs to have this, and it's the arbiter between a sentimentally encouraging feel-good kind of education that temporarily seems to do the trick, but it's only a trick and fails exactly at those crucial moments when one desperately needs to not fail. And so this kind of education is literally indispensable. There is a curious quality which we alluded to, I think it must be about seven weeks ago, perhaps a little bit more. We were talking, reading from a book on Paleolithic art by Max Raphael, one of the Bollingen volumes, one of the early ones from the 1940s. And Max Raphael, a great artistic connoisseur and deep critic of artistic form, observed that in Paleolithic art there is very frequently the convex line and the concave line but that they are never joined together. One never gets that sine wave, that tilde shape, that is the full energy throb. One always has the one or the other as a pair, as a resonant pair, but they are never put together in a mistaken oneness of identity. Because Paleolithic man <clears throat> understood, not with the refined university mind that we seem to characterize intelligence with in our time, but 35, 40,000 years ago, man was not stupid at all and never made mistakes on something crucial like what is real. Never. 
That's how we got here. They knew. They practiced it. They never joined those two together to make a single one. They always kept them disparate so that the resonance of the mystery could breathe through them. Now this is extremely important when it comes to understand Ruth Benedict. Patterns of culture. The whole development of anthropology as a part of nature. The whole interface of anthropologically characterized nature vis-a-vis -vis the microbiological revolution of the double helix and the very interesting way in which the double helix ribbon when it is together forms that life as long as the two helixes are joined by their phosphate hydrogen bonds, by their sugared bonds, you have a being who is objective. That tree, this human, that mouse, this bee, that flower, the thingness of reality is because those two are joined in that way. But in order to have some new life, they must methodically disjoin back into their resonant pairs, allowing for nothingness to be there. And only then does the mystery of life occur again. And each separated half engenders resonantly out of the mystery its other pair, and they join together and reestablish their bonds in a nice sequence, and there's an embryo. God's truth. This is exactly the way it happens. We must be wise enough to understand that there must be no confusion. Both forms are needed. But the one form creates and the other is the creation. There must be no mistaking, no confusion between this. The created cannot create until it learns to disassemble its oneness into, back into the mysterious zero. <laughs> Only then does creation happen. Only then could it happen. This is a wisdom point. And any education that is unable to make this point and understand it should excuse themselves from the podium of the world at this time and take a seat and become a student. Let's take a look at Ruth Benedict's Patterns of Culture, which came out in 1934. Let's take a look at it Almost 60 years later, this is a book which was published by the University of Wisconsin Press called The Ethnographer's Magic and Other Essays in the History of Anthropology, published in 1992 by the University of Wisconsin Press, my alma mater as an undergraduate. On page 162, under a chapter, Ideas and Institutions in American Anthropology, he brings in, by conspicuous mention, Ruth Benedict's Patterns of Culture, because it is far and away the most singular, interesting anthropological work of the 20th century. Why? Let's listen to just a paragraph or so. The culmination of this romantic trend in anthropology was, of course, Benedict's Patterns of Culture, which appeared in 1934. The single most influential American reading public, the single most influential anthropological work of the interwar period, 
Benedict's book offered to the American reading public, he uses the uh, adjective here, Boasian view. That's from jo uh, uh, Franz Boas, who was her teacher. A Boasian view. So this book was the single most important anthropological work in the interwar period. First World War, Second World War, 1914 to 1945. In a whole 30-year span, it's, it's the, the work. And anthropology before the First World War is on a whole different basis. Anthropology after the Second World War is on a completely different basis yet. The anthropology before the First World War is kind of a romantic adventure of finding out strange peoples and other ways of living. The anthropology after the Second World War is a cold, methodical categorizing of stuff. Before the First World War, there were Jack Londons. And after the Second World War, well... They don't have names. <laughs> and their articles are, are legion. Uh, not to confuse it with the ancient definition of evil. So that Ruth Benedict's book, I'm saying to you, on this teeter-totter of two extremes, is the fulcrum. Her work balances the whole outlook of science, not just anthropology, but what happens. And yet, this is a science which is reflective back, back on the whole way in which man and nature pulsate together and produce culture. And that out of that culture comes language, and out of that language comes the interiorization of thought. So in that whole ecology of nature, ritual, myth, and symbol, the way in which that ecology works, one of the clearest threads that links them together is anthropology, and the Fulcrum book in the 20th century, late 19th century, the Fulcrum book of the last 130 years, by which one could balance the whole endeavor and learn something important, is Ruth Benedict's Patterns of Culture. She's an enormously important woman, important human being, because she got it right. Sixty years later, we hear a man, George Stocking, commenting on her work. Let's go back and start again, because now we can hear a little bit more of what's being read to us. The culmination of this romantic trend was, of course, Benedict's Patterns of Culture, which appeared in 1934. The single most influential anthropological work of the interwar period. Benedict's book offered to the American reading public a Boasian view of cultural determinism that seemed to carry the doctrine of cultural relativity to its logical conclusion in the ultimate incommensurability of each human mode of life. Let's pause here for a second. Let's put a bracket in here. Los Angeles, 1994, is the great world example of the incommensurability of human cultural modes. Left to themselves, cultural modes qua cultural modes do not commensurate. They clash, they bounce, they fight, they slash tires of cars and slash throats of each other, but they do not integrate. Something else is needed. 
and it could save tens of billions of dollars a year just in this country alone to understand this very real scientific point. To make various cultural modes commensurate, one needs something called civilization, which is an entirely different energy frequency from culture. It's called civilization. And it is so distinctly different that it even works out in mathematical universal functioning as a different procedure. And when a statement is made from this particular chair that in the whole ecology of cultural integration there are no persons, I mean to say that. It seems impossible, but my reply is that it is illusional. And the deepest human wisdom has resolved this again and again, so many millions of times that it is an unmistakable reality. It is a truth. When you carry integration to its ultimate, the integrating focus disappears back into the mystery. You do not end up with oneness, with an egotistical point, you end up with selflessness, which is universally mysterious. The array of teachable, methodical procedures that deliver this is in the tens of thousands. I myself could show you several dozen. The confirmable, scientific, objective result of those integrating procedures is that one returns back to zero. Because eventually the oneness that one thought was there dissolves into the zero which is actually there. This is inescapable. And those who draw the bottom line at being realistic in this world. This is the bottom line. This is what is realistic. And there can be no practicality to any education that, that does not consciously found itself upon this. Just as in mathematics, one has to appreciate. Now, let's continue here. Let's come back, catch this up. One of the one of the conclusions, one of the points in patterns of culture is that human cultural modes left to themselves and brought together in juxtaposition are incommensurate. Fortuitous um, gas. Stocking, writing in 1992. But in the aftermath, now he's talking about patterns of culture, he's also noting that it came out in 1934, during the Great Depression. In fact, 1934 was a pretty grim year. If you don't remember American history, the Great Depression really started, uh, they say, after the October 1929 crash. But 1930 was an interesting year. And Herbert Hoover was an international expert at distribution of goods and wealth and so forth and made a really valiant attempt to bring things back. And in fact, by the end of 1930, it looked like things might work. And then in 1931, they began to slide again. And in 1932, there was this tremendous realization that something structural was wrong. And that's why Franklin Roosevelt was elected, because he in a very real way, characterized in a very famous uh, uh, speech that though something structurally was wrong, we had only one thing to fear, and that was fear itself. 
1932, the New Deal came in, and in the first hundred days, many changes were happening. In 1933, it seemed that not only were things beginning to improve, but all of a sudden, in the background, it seemed as if some something in world civilization began to slide as like slipping away forever. The Nazis came to power in Germany. A lot of the programs that looked good in 1932 began not to really work. The very nature of money as a valuation commodity began to be questioned. A great mathematician in England named Kings began to write some very poignant essays. So that by 1934, the world was in a very precarious position. It still had the courage to keep trying, but there was like a vacant sense of horror that no matter what one did, this was going to get worse. So Ruth Benedict's Patterns of Culture came out exactly at this peculiar. It's like I used a word in a poem once uh, in a James Joyce in a way, strange lovely. One word. There was a strange lovely ambivalence in 1934 in the world. Very, very peculiar. Stocking rights, 1992. But in the aftermath of economic collapse, some of the inherent ambiguities of cultural relativism began to manifest themselves. In other words, whatever had been a working substrate that kept the various disparate cultural modes operating together, that began to slip away. And one of the manifestations was the rise of National Socialism in Germany, the Nazis, at a meteoric rise. It was like an asymptotic thing. It was like all of a sudden the demon is out of the bottle. And in the United States, as a direct complement to that, there was the realization that men standing in the same bread line were mumbling to themselves and not talking to each other. And to someone as perspicacious as the vibrant Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he saw this as a real danger sign. And one of the responses to that was to take them out of their individual mumbling line and put them to work together in CCC camps. Put them out into nature again. Put these individual muttering lonely men back into nature and, and let the magic of nature take its course. If you guys have to build stone paths together for a year, maybe you'll start talking together and that was part of that New Deal spirit that breathed hope back into the United States again. My estimation, Roosevelt is a, is a 20th century Lincoln because it was lost. It was gone. It was gone. It had to be brought back out of the mysteriousness of the spirit, just like Lincoln had done. Because if you understand how to work with the zero-based reality, even though you're left with nothing, nothing is the creative medium if you're spiritually alive. At the very center of the apex of the Sistine Chapel, the private prayer room in the Vatican for the Pope himself, the very center of the ceiling of that Sistine Chapel is Michelangelo's God creating man by the two fingers separated so that the arc of creation can happen. It's as bare bones as that. And if that's what's in the center of the Pope's private prayer chapel, you can bet that they had understood that point very, very clearly at one time. And especially when Sixtus was paying out all of that money to this madman to keep him there. Having Michelangelo around every day was not easy, even if you're Pope.
<laughs> Sorry. Loud and dirty, I know. So Stocking, writing about Ruth Benedict's Patterns of Culture coming out in 1934, is saying something important here. Benedict showed that cultures left without an integrating substrate will be incommensurate forever. You could roll those dice forever. There's no melting pot that happens. They will fight forever. Integration requires a transformation. And very frequently, the transformation comes in the form of changing the energy of the substrate. And when you understand that, then you can do something real. Then you can change things. It's the way nature works, and one has to be able to go back to nature. Stocking writes, clearly for Benedict, relativism did not necessarily imply a non-judgmental attitude towards all cultural forms. The current, current sociological mess comes from a misunderstanding in the late 1960s of the non-judgmental attitude. Well, those people have a right to be those people. And that's really good if there's just one tribe. But as soon as there's two tribes or more, you got feuding time. <laughs> and we are in a permanent feud sociologically, culturally, anthropologically, that cannot be resolved in terms of which the problem occurs. Intelligence, universal principle, indicate that one must bring in a synthesizing transformation. Otherwise, it'll go on forever. There's no limit to this. Two, or th two of the three cultures she studied in order to, quote, pass judgment on the dominant traits of our own civilization could easily be read as pathological parodies of the worst aspects of the Puritan and robber baron traditions. And the Apollonian integration of the Zuni was obviously posed against the, quote, wanton waste of revolution and economic and emotional disaster that seemed to threaten Western civilization. In short, while the essential attitudinal posture of Benedict's patterns was still romanticist, one can see in it hints of a reemergent social engineering impulse which some Boz Bozanians, like Margaret Mead, had always been quite strong. By 1934, in the midst of economic chaos and reemergent political reform, the progressivist impulse now largely cleaned, cleansed of its earlier manifest racialism had clearly reasserted itself. Some of the more scientific approaches to cultural integration of the 1930s should doubtless be viewed in this context. There is an obvious consonance between the increasing emphasis on functional integration and the adaptive aspects of culture and the issues facing, facing American society in this period. In other words, even though cultures tend to defend themselves, they have an adaptive spin which is essential to their preservation. And if one gauges the synthesizing element, including all of the adaptive notes of the various divergent cultures, one can sound a consonant synthesizing chord. The first person to ever consciously do that was Pythagoras. And Pythagorean mystical communities are the first to ever sound the chord of conscious civilization. And upon that is built the whole rise of great civilizations that include the differential as well as the integral modes of life on this planet. Let's take a break. One thing that uh, you're going to need eventually is this little kit, the Molecular Model Set. 
and it's been difficult to find for the last uh, year and a half, uh, the University of California bookstore, UCLA bookstore, has about six sets of this. So if you go into that bookstore, at the very back in the science section against the far wall, on the top shelves, you'll find six little boxes of this. I picked them up now because it's very difficult to find. And um, it is essential to show us that the objective structure actually happens. But that's only half of what is real. The objective structure happens because of integration. The other half of what is real is not based on integration, but based on differentiation. Now, a great emphasis on structuralism since the 1960s produced a bastardization of differentiation. And instead of getting the universal principle of differentiation as the complement to integration, universities around the world have turned out a generation of people who are idiots. Excuse me. And they call their bastardization deconstruction. That's that old unified stupidity that mistakes that the other is somehow connected to this, the shin bones connected to the ankle bone. They don't pay attention to the mystery of life. They don't, as the Chinese used to say, hear the wind in the pines. Differentiation, not deconstruction, is the complement to integration. There's no deconstruction uh, uh, calculus. <laughs> hey! But there is a differential calculus that complements the integral calculus very nicely, and you can build things with that. The only thing that you build with a bogus deconstructionalist cal calculus is the nightmare culture fodder that produces incommensurate persons as well as incommensurate cultures. Let's wake up in the morning and get to work. When you put the convex curve of integration together with the concave curve of differentiation, you place them together, you get that sine wave that's characteristic. In trigonometry, one recognizes right away. It is also an energy wave. It's the universal form by which energy is registered, that energy wave. And when you put two energy waves together, you get the infinity sign, which is the shared life eternity, which is the double helix in its universal aspect, its cosmic aspect. In the Tao, and remember we began the nature section with the I Ching and Thoreau, because we're emphasizing here that what is primordial in nature, in its mystery, is change. Zero-based change is primordial. This characterizes nature in such a way that when the resonant pairs occur, they create objective manifestations that are real. Not because they're written in concrete, but because they're based upon the substrate 
of the resonance that is capable of creation out of that zero base. <clears throat> All the way through the Taoist civilization of China, one finds, one pays attention to, one finds attentively at every major juncture, every major historical phrase, the restatement again and again of this universal principle. The first great writer in Chinese civilization on art theory Xia Ho, who flourished about 1,500 years ago, had six principles that good art should have, and the very first principle is a restatement of this sine wave, this energy form, pulsation, in Chinese Taoist terms. The Chinese pronunciation was of the principle was uh, jian, Sheng Tang. Sheng Tang. Qi Yun. Like Qi, like in Qi. Like the Qi of the breath. Qi Yun Sheng Tang. The best translation of it is somewhere around spirit resonance life movement. The very first principle of Taoist art is that a work should have spirit movement because there is a resonance. The spirit resonance in its resonating gives the life movement. Oneness has a peculiar habit. <laughs> Oneness has the ritual disposition to be only what it is, to be absolutely still, to come to rest. And the impractical, worldly, illusionary mind mistakes that for objectively real. or rather to restate it, sees the reality of that, but has no clue whatsoever of the fact that when something comes completely, absolutely to rest, it disappears out of the phenomenal realm. Now in the physical universe that we're acquainted with, everything has a little bit of a temperature. <laughs> the universal cosmic background temperature is still three degrees Kelvin. It's not absolute zero at all. It's three degrees Kelvin. So that even intergalactic black space has been heated to three degrees Kelvin <laughs> in order for it to be physically there still. Because one, when one reaches ultimate absolute zero, you drop out of the manifest stuff objective universe. PDQ is too slow. In terms of Ruth Benedict's patterns of culture and the kind of ethnographic criticality that we have brought to bear this morning, let me just give this kind of information and then shift to late 20th century science in order to illustrate it for us so that we can appreciate that nature is really as is being talked about. Ruth Benedict writes about culture and the true characterization of the cycle of cultural integration is that nature is zero-based. It's a zero-based objective existence 
So when it's nature, it's zero-based, when it's objective of existence, that's where our ritual, our next whole section of our education, is all about objective of existence. A zero-based objective existence resonated through experience. That's going to be the mythic section. Resonated through experience. Ritual existence. Mythic experience culminates in essence. That's the symbol section. So it's like the quality that very often Jung talked about in terms of the therapy of wholeness. That all that one can give to another are three of the four points. The other has to find the fourth point on their own. You can establish the point that existence is real, experience is real, essence is real, but it's up to you to establish that zero base is real. No one can do that for you. You must do that. How do you do that? Through carrying integration in its natural ecology through to its resolution and realization. With the specific proviso that the very last movement is a non-movement. It's a movement of acceptance. The final stage of integration is always acceptance. So that what one generates in integration increasingly is meaning, but meaning only becomes truth when it's accepted. If no one accepted it, it's not true. Even though the meaning is verifiable at every stage up to that, if it's not accepted, it does not become true. But when meaning accepted becomes truth, it becomes instantly absorptive. <laughs> so that the quality of the physical manifest objective universe culminates in an identifiable absorption line quality at its synthesizing thread, which is light. The synthesizing thread of objective existence all the way through is light. And light displays universal capacity to disclose its absorptive line spectrum. <laughs> the art of reading that is called spectroscopy. There are books <laughs> about it. One can find books like this one, Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Spectroscopy. NMR. I'm sure you've seen the, the little mobile scientific home, mobile home scientific units next to hospitals now. NMR. Athletes, baseball players, football players have NMRs. Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Spectroscopy. Why? Because reality leaves its footprints. And the footprints record as matter, but the walker records as energy. And you can be a real good Sherlock Holmes and follow the footsteps. But until you're able to look up and see who's making those footsteps, who the walker is, you're never going to know something really important. But looking up is a paradox, because when you look up, you do not see someone else there. 
you have to be aware that the looker is he or she who is seeing. Only the looker is there. And it takes what's called a recursive functioning awareness to understand that. And without that, one is forever looking in vain. Where, where, is, where is gone? When it comes to the double helix, which is the complement then, when it comes to this double helix structure of DNA, that structure discloses to us at once both the oneness which establishes the physical manifestation, the phenomenon. The phenomenon happens because the two DNA helixes are a single operating unit. It's like the, it's like the little forked magical wand of creation. You can think of it as wide as you want, like William Blake's great calipers that the Creator holds when he draws the circle of life. It doesn't have to be these little stubby fingers. It can be a Blake-like huge cosmic caliper. And if you had Leonardo da Vinci's structural engineering eye, you could look into the circle that William Blake's Creator draws and you could see universal man inhabiting the entirety of the space of that circle. The lesson is this. The zero base Tao of nature means that pairing surrounds the zero. Think of a sandwich. You got bread, what's in the sandwich? What's real? God's kind of cheese. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. Where you run out of suggestions of what kind of cheese it could be, that's what kind it is. When you're all exhausted with trying to enumerate what it could be, and you hush up because there's nothing more that it could be. That's what it is. It's the coda of not saying at the end of the infinite list of possibilities that none of those work. As when you stop making the list or adding to the list and you say nothing more, that's what's there in that sandwich of pairing. The pairing surrounds the zero, so that one can now say this. There's a vibration in that pairing. There's a resonance, but the resonance occurs also as a vibration, so that one can characterize that pairing as a vibronic coupling. It's a very legitimate term in physics, vibronic coupling. The interaction between the electric and nuclear motions. Gad Fisher, Ben-Gurion University, 1984. Besides reading the Torah, there are physicists also. Vibranic coupling. Let's take a look at something that uh, Fisher has in here. Something that's important about this, about vibranic coupling, because the double helix is a vibronically coupled actuality. And even though some of the applications have not been made, all of the ingredients of the mass, of the microbiological 
of the computing, of the artistic insight are all in place for a snap wake up call. All it takes is some conductor to bring the orchestra back into tune and say we have got an ancient musical score. Let's now play it with these instruments and hear how it sounds. About three or four years away. Let it go. Three or four years ago. Now here is chapter 10 out of Vibranic Coupling, the first paragraph or so, and it, and it concerns the solid state. It's like the old high school physics of the 1940s. You have solids, you have liquids, you have gases, and then later on they learn to their surprise that there are also plasmas. And there also is out of that for a whole realm of non-fours. <laughs> <laughs> but the solid state. Number chapter 10, and then the first little section, 10.1. It's a takeoff on uh, Wittgenstein's Tractatus Logical Philosophicus. Uh, he used to number his paragraphs, and 1.1 in Wittgenstein was uh, the statement, the world is everything that is the case. <laughs> a perfectly sound logical statement, but what it finally turns out to be after 25, 30 years of investigation, Wittgenstein's conclusion was, whereupon a man cannot speak, therefore must he remain silent. <laughs> it's a very good conclusion, very honest. Wittgenstein, when he was a when he was a, uh, a, a brilliant uh, graduate student at uh, Cambridge University in the great days when uh, Bertrand Russell and uh, uh, Sri Aurobindo and all those people, before Sri Aurobindo was uh, Sri Aurobindo, all of those people were there. And Wittgenstein rode one of the earliest motorcycles and he dressed in khaki jackets, I mean shades of Berkeley. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he used to get these insights in the middle of the night. He used to... Um, he used to pace in his uh, uh, army jacket uh, in a cold, bare living room or dining room or kitchen in a little hovel where he was living in Cambridge and uh, trying to get his Viennese blood uh, warmed up in this uh, Cambridge, England chill. And he would get these insights about logical truth and he would hop on his cycle and rev it up and drive over to Lord Russell's place. Bertrand Russell was the Lord, right? Uh, very, very proper Englishman. And he would pound on the front door until the butler would come down and wake up Lord Russell. And uh, Lord Russell would come down and instead of hearing the latest insight from brilliant Wittgenstein, he would have the butler throw him out. <laughs> <laughs> I myself have been thrown out many times. <laughs> We're talking about vibranic coupling, about the fact that it is very, very mysterious that nuclear physics should operate exactly the same way that Taoist insight happens. I don't mean to be critical of the Tao physics. I use it as a textbook. I've, I've used it for 20 years. It's wonderful, but it misses the indispensable, astonished quality that is necessary for education to take off. Without it, it cannot fly. And we live in a time where we've got to be able to get off the ground educationally. Gad Fisher writes, this chapter is devoted to the consideration of vibronic effects in the solid state. The discussion is restric restricted to molecular crystals, where the Frenkel tight binding model of the excitation wave, the exciton, the excitation wave, the energy wave coming into a crystal. A crystal, an energy wave, like an arrow shot into it. What happens? 
What happens applies then to vibronic coupling. Molecular crystals are characterized by intermolecular forces. Inter, inside the molecules, intermolecular forces that are much weaker than the forces holding the molecule together. In consequence, the molecular properties are only weakly perturbed by the neighboring molecules. It's just like cultures that are thrown together and they don't have any way of integrating. The same thing happens on the level of molecular crystals. It's a universal phenomenon. It has a universal solution. Our social problems continue indefinitely because of stupidity. We can't afford to keep it up. Molecular crystals are characterized by intermolecular forces that are much weaker than the forces holding the molecule together. The substratum is much stronger, not much stronger, but enough stronger so that there is a differential. All a mountain climber needs is enough to get one digit in there and he can go. Intellectual mountain climbers. In consequence of this, the fact that the intermolecular structure forces are weaker than the forces of the molecule as a whole, in consequence, the molecular properties are only weakly perturbed by neighboring molecules. An obvious extension of this property of molecular crystals pertains to the differentiation between the two types of nuclear motion. Namely, that the atoms constituting the molecule and that of the molecules as a whole. This differentiation between the relative magnitudes, the relative magnitudes of the frequencies of the various motions, is a fundamental concern in the selection of an appropriate theoretical framework for the delineation of the crystal levels and wave functions. And this is true whether it's in relation to intramolecular and intermolecular lattice vibrations, or whether it's the relation to excitation transfer, that is to say the, the frequency bandwidth, and the lattice vibrations. It doesn't matter what physics laboratory you work this out in in the world. It doesn't just work at Ben Gurion University. You can take it anywhere. You can set up a physics laboratory on the moon. It's, it works this way. To the penetrating eye of wisdom, one can see that this shows a structural quality of differentiation that has nothing to do with a deconstructionalist fantasizing. Nothing whatsoever to do with it. This works that plays mumbly peg forever and frequently stabs one's toes. Excuse me. In principle, one can treat the crystal as a giant molecule and apply the techniques discussed in earlier chapters. But, in view of the very large numbers of degrees of freedom, this poses a formidable problem and may offer little insight into the interaction between the electronic and nuclear motions. In a scheme where the intermolecular interactions are weak, the free molecule wave functions provide an appropriate zero-order basis. There is a definite advantage in maintaining an explicit relationship between the crystal properties and their free molecule parentage, since there is a close relationship between the two 
and available data on the free molecular properties allows for quantitative calculation of crystal properties. Okay, just leave that suspended for a second. There are such things as liquid crystals. The Japanese would say, ne. <laughs> there are liquid crystals. The human body works by lasing energy through liquid crystals. And there are liquid crystals, even in physics laboratories. This is a, one of the classics. Oxford studies that came out in 1974 with additions 1975. The physics of liquid crystals. The upshot of this vibronic coupling has something to do with the resonance. And because the resonance is truly fulcrumed on a zero basis. One is allowed to work with the nuclear magnetic resonance as it registry, registers in a spectrum as long as one keeps in mind, like an unspoken algorithm, the true functioning on the substrate of zero base. The math is very clear about this. There's no way that it does not happen. So that when you come to chapter 6 of nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, the NMR of the solid state, and you find down here on page 145, Section 6.2, Magic Angle Rotation. Lord Almighty. <laughs> no, it's not uh, 1588. It's um, uh, 1986. New magic Angle Rotation. You crack the binding of these books by this. 6.1, The Two-Spin System. Whoa, they say in um, San Fernando. In solids, in solids, Johnny Carson move over. <laughs> Need an Ed McMahon. Where's Ed? Where's Dr. Ed? In solids, the molecules are generally held rather rigidly so that dipolar interactions are not averaged to zero in the manner described for liquids. In liquids, they average very close to zero. In solids, they don't quite get that close. Question. It's like Michael York interviewing the computer, the master computer in Logan's Run. Question. Question, O cosmic computer. Are there gas crystals? Yes. Question. Are there plasma crystals? Yes. You're getting warmer. Question, are there gravity crystals? Yes. So what are you going to do about it? It is an insight of astonishing proportions. The whole purpose of this educational pattern is to deliver you to the place where you could ask that question and mean it and hear yourself the process of inquiry that's necessary to make that answer that came to you intelligible. And we need all of these processes together. And it's much more complicated than just drumming together. Nice as that is. There's more to it than that. There is also a biological spectroscopy. <laughs> Living organisms. That's why there can be NMRs of somebody's pitching shoulder. Because biological organisms, 
display an analytical insight spectroscopy. Why? Because there's such a thing as nuclear magnetism. This is, I think, uh, the oldest monograph that uh, we're using today. Oxford, uh, 1961. Uh, the last corrections were 1978. Principles of Nuclear Magnetism. At one time, this was the book. General Introduction, Section A, entitled Nuclear Paramagnetism. Three kinds of magnetism. Paramagnetism is the one that one investigates for nuclear um, uh, magnetism at that time. Uh, some of the others were a little bit out of range in 1961. They're in range now. The subject matter of this book is the magnetic behavior of assemblies of large numbers of atomic nuclei. We denote their collective macroscopic magnetic properties by the term nuclear magnetism in analogy with the term electronic magnetism for assemblies of electrons. When the bar is full of electrons and they're all singing together, then you've got electronic magnetism. But when that crowd leaves, and all of the nucleuses come, they sing a different song. They don't sing those songs, they sing different songs. These are the beer and pretzel crowd, this is the wine and cheese crowd. They both love parties, magnetic parties, but they have different tastes. And there's a third kind. There are three usual aspects of magnetism namely ferromagnetism, or anti-ferromagnetism. It can go either way. The, um, the uh, uh, Maxwell field equations go either way. Dimagnetism and paramagnetism. Only the last is of interest in nuclear magnetism. Why? Because it was the only one that they could really investigate and use at that time. And out of this comes the work in NMR, directly. It took a while but directly it comes out. It will be remembered that ferromagnetism may arise when the temperature, T, the temperature, and then scientific, they always give you the, uh, the, uh, the symbol that would be used in equations. It will be remembered that ferromagnetism may arise when the temperature, T, of the sample times, that is multiply, multiply T to the constant K, which is the Boltzmann constant, so that one would write it K capital T, small case K capital T, KT. When that becomes comparable to the couplings between the spins, the strong exchange coupling of electrostatic origin that gives rise to electronic ferromagnetism is absent in nuclear magnetism. It's not there. Why? Because it is in a different horizon of manifestation. The magnetic and because of the smallness of nuclear moments We'll get to moments in just a second. A moment, uh, um, a moment is, is an occurrence. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, it's, it's an occurrence. It's a term that comes out of uh, spectroscopy. The strong exchange coupling of electrostatic origin that gives rise to electronic ferromagnetism is absent in nuclear magnetism and because of the smallness of nuclear moments the magnetic coupling between nuclear spins is such that the temperature of the of the order of 10 to the minus 7 Kelvin or less would be required for a possible observation of nuclear ferromagnetism.
This makes nuclear ferromagnetism a subject beyond experimental possibilities for the time being, although possibly not forever. In a satellite orbiting the planet rather than in a laboratory on the planet, the chances are, are much better. In a laboratory in between stars, it would be ever so much better. Ever so much better. And one could then really uh, investigate and see. This uh, hasn't occurred uh, to the um, um, uh, legislators of any good country so far. Vibronic coupling. One of the ancient wisdom principles is that the second deepest secret of nature is that pairs, pairing is the first deepest secret. The second deepest secret is that pairs also pair. And that's how you get quaternaries. That's how you get the fourness. That's how you get the square. And nuclear magnetism, one calls that quadrupole, a quadrupole. And quadrupoles have effects, very interesting effects. Very interesting effects. So that chapter 7 of Principles of Nuclear Magnetism, fine structure of resonance lines dash quadrupole effects. This is all what is true of nature. We didn't take it in other nature sections because we're trying, we were trying to build up. Now we have to push it just a little bit, up, upping the ante. People who dropped out because they had had nature before, missing it, that's all. In chapter 4, we gave a description of the shape of a single Zeeman resonance line in a solid. Think of a, the, whatever this Zeeman line is. It's like an excitation energy wave coming in to a solid, like a crystal. In chapter 4, we gave a description of the shape of a single Zeeman resonance line in a solid that line broadens, broadened by dipolar couplings between the spins. The pairs are not statically there. The pairs each have their own spin, and together there's a dance. And so when an energy line comes into that dance, it flowers in such a way that you get a bandwidth. Every bandwidth is like a is like a flower. And because this happens trillions of times per nanosecond, the way an angelic eye would see the cosmos is like a field of spring flowers going on forever. Whew. In the present chapter, we consider spectra that because of particularly strong dipolar couplings or because of quadrupole couplings exhibit a structure. Lo and behold, a structure occurs. Under certain conditions, this structure may disappear. The structure may disappear, and what happens? A single line then appears. Sometimes a single line broadens out and you get a structure, and sometimes the structure disappears and you're back to the single line. Now one of the peculiarities of geometry, not of the geometry that was misused uh, in the 19th century and, and early 20th century education, but the original geometry, Euclid's Pythagorean geometry, it's 1.1 beginning. Euclid's geometry begins with the statement, not that the world is everything the case, but that a point is a locus of no dimension. People who toss away the old-fashioned Newtonian physics because it is based upon Oh, this weird Keplerian mystical mathematics, which in turn is based upon Pythagorean geometry that goes back to Euclid. And, oh, how could you go with such old stuff? Well, the old stuff was very filled with wisdom. A point is a locus of no dimension. 
Euclid's geometry is zero-based, son of a gun, so that it computes very, very adequately, so that one can understand that here is something really interesting. In a book on principles of nuclear magnetism late in the 20th century, on a chapter, Fine Structure of Resonance Lines, Quadrupole Effects, resonance lines, when they come into a phenomena, broaden out in a frequency determination that flowers as a structure. And that structure is commensurate, it's commutable, with returning disappearingly back into the single line again. And you can draw a line so fine because a point has no dimension, its locus has no dimension, the line can be so thin that it doesn't occur as a single dimension even. If you think in a stupid, ignorant way that the line still occurs as a single dimension, you get then a universe where you can tie knots. <laughs> A knot being a single dimensional line that is constantly self-avoiding and alien to the three-dimensional setting in which it occurs. Finito. <laughs> More next week.